It's time for the Thursday Live. Um, I always seem to start these things with weather reports and why should today be any different? So here in Wisconsin, we already had snow, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, um, about two inches of snow. It was gone, I don't know, three or four days later, most of it was gone. And then weirdly, uh, we've had a lot of 25 degree mornings, but weirdly next week, it's supposed to be 60 almost all week. Um, so that, what, like a week before Thanksgiving, right? For it to be that warm here a week before Thanksgiving. I was telling somebody, um, they're asking like normal weather patterns. And I used to live on a hobby farm that had a one acre pond. And when my kids were little, um, there were Thanksgivings, many Thanksgivings where we ice skated on Thanksgiving. So that one acre of water had frozen enough that um, it was safe to be on by Thanksgiving. It, that nothing will be frozen by Thanksgiving this year. Um, before we jump in, as always, big thank you to Tight Bond for sponsoring this. The other thing I want to talk about is something you've not seen talked about yet. Um, behind the scenes, we have been working on the Cutting Board Challenge 2023. So myself, Paul Mayer, who you're familiar with from lots and lots of content on WWGOA, Alicia Albertson, who is Pneumatic Addict on her own channel, Char Miller King, who is Wooden Maven. We've all built cutting boards that we're gonna show you. Each one has a unique design. Additionally, we have made a bunch of videos. There's five different cutting board related videos. So where this is all going is there's a video that, that still has a sticker on it, hang on. There's a video that at the simplest level, I have zero fingernails, shows you how to make an edge grain cutting board, okay? There's another video that then shows you how to make an end grain cutting board. This one obviously is not sanded and finished yet. There's another video that shows you how to put a juice groove in, and another video that shows you how to put finger holds in the end, like that. And a fifth video is how to make a leveling jig for your handheld router so that when you make an end grain cutting board, which should not go through your planer, you can use that router based jig in order to level this. So um, on November 15th, that's next week, at this time, at four o'clock central time, Alicia and Char and Paul will join me live and we'll show you our crazy cool designs. This one is mine, spoiler alert, with those neat inlays in it. Um, so again, each of our four designs is a little bit different. So November 15th at four o'clock, watch your email. This is gonna come, um, you'll get notified by email. And we'll talk about our designs and then you'll also be able to access all that other stuff. Um, there's a big PDF available for you, the how-to steps by which we created said designs are all there. Um, so November 15th, four o'clock. Um, like I said, I'll be live with those three folks to talk about their designs. And then also the, all the other stuff will be ready for you to look at. Oki and Doki. We have some preguntas hoy. Ron says, I would like to get some tips, particularly on my lathe. I make pens and other gifts that have tubes that you glue into a piece of wood or other products. My question is, what are some needed attachments or processes I can learn to make like a handle for a pizza cutter where there is no mandrel, no structure, just turning on the lathe? I just need some tips. Feel free to shorten my W. It just, he shortened himself. It just kind of ended. Uh, oh, my comment. Um, too late. I just read the whole thing. Um, so we've got some stuff on this. Um, I have turned a lot of, um, so I, what Paul's talking about in the big picture here are these very typical pen kits where you take a chunk of wood, you drill a hole, you use CA glue, you put in a brass barrel, and then you put um, a mandrel on your lathe, 
bushings on the mandrel, and you turn to shape and size. There are other projects where um, I've made a lot of coffee scoop handles. Oh, please. So this coffee scoop, that's a piece of deer antler. Um, it's similar in that there's a hole in the end, but you don't drill it through hole. You don't use brass barrels. The mechanism, the coffee scoop, uh, Starbucks star crust, please, is uh, simply glued into that hole. So um, there are some videos on the site on WWGOA about this, Paul. Uh, no, Ron, sorry. And um, Penn State, um, they have got a boatload of products like this, you know, uh, pizza cutters and all that stuff. Um, and I think they're pretty good at providing support videos for that. So first, you know, just use the search function on www.goa.com and look up pizza cutter, coffee scoop. What else have I done? Pens. Um, and that'll get you started. And then, um, and then go and grow from there. Um, I do, um, let's see the wine bottles. I've done a lot of wine bottle stoppers. I don't have one of those here to show you. Um, those don't take a mandrel, but you do drill and tap a hole. Um, it's usually three, eight, 16. Um, so a little bit different approach to that. Paul says, good afternoon, George. Working on a project, an outdoor lawn decoration. I'd like to know what wood that is best to last a long period of time. Doesn't need to be replaced often. What do you suggest? So it depends. Um, when someone says long decoration, I don't know, you know, in my brain that jumps to like something big. Uh, if it's large and in charge, there are exterior plywoods where they can live completely outside. One example of that is MDO. Don't confuse that with MDF. Uh, MDF, medium density fiberboard. I just unloaded a metric ton of it in my shop today. Got my work out in um, MDO, medium density overlay, very commonly used to make signs. I've cut lots of it on the CNC, um, a camp kitchen project that I recently did for WWGOA is all made out of MDO. So in the sheet stock world, exterior plywood like MDO would be a choice. Um, in the world of just woods, Woods that are naturally weather resistant are Western red cedar, um, some of the mahoganies, white oak. Now, weather resistant um, doesn't mean they're not going to change their look and their color over time. So, like if you make something out of cedar and you're going to have it live outside, if you want it to always look like cedar, you still need to seal it and you'll have to maintain that finish over time. But the wood can have some level of ground contact and still be okay for a very long period, you know, and get obviously rained on and snowed on. Um, a newer material in this marketplace and that marketplace is um, not thermally fused, thermally modified materials. So I've done some stuff with thermally modified ash. You're probably aware of all the ash trees that are being cut down. And one of the things some places are doing with them is thermally modifying the material. What they do is it's very much like what it sounds. They put it in a big oven, they heat it. The chemistry of that is such that it changes the material to where that thermally modified ash with no further treatment can live outside like a pressure treated lumber can. Here in my area, in the Minneapolis area, um, a company called Wood from the Hood is one that I know of that's doing that. But if you just search thermally modified ash, you can probably find a supplier in your area that's doing the same thing. So there are some um, material suggestions for you. 
I apologize for being a little raspy today. John says, just purchased my first lathe. Congratulations. Any tips on how to begin simple to handle projects and techniques? Watch all the George Rondriska lathe turning videos. There's my tip. Um, I am an avid turner, um, and WWGOA has recorded me doing many, 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 many lathe related videos. So um, a lot of old stuff, a fair bit of spindle stuff. And, um, and I would also say, um, if you can go take a class someplace, a hands-on class, that is definitely worth doing. And here's the reason. When I first started turning, I watched a lot of Riff Richard Raffin videos. He's a very good turner. And one of the things he does really well in his videos is he talks about the body mechanics of using a lathe. And there's a lot of that. The benefit to a hands-on class over uh, my videos or Raffin's videos is that when you're standing at the lathe, and I do this with turning classes in here all the time, and you're like, there's a lot of stuff where just your shoulders are in the wrong position, your hips are in the wrong position, and that affects your ability to turn. Um, turning is really not just a hand thing like this. There's a lot of body English involved to make it go well. So um, if you can take a hands-on class at a Woodcraft, Rockler, the Mark Adams School. Um, just, you know, again, Google is your friend. Look for wood turning classes in your area. And that will be a quantum leap forward in advancing your skills. Ron says, I enjoy learning excellent tips from you during these live events. A while back, you mentioned utilizing cactus juice to stabilize wood. Once wood has been soaked and vacuumed, is there a baking step that's required? Um, as far as I know, yes. So I've actually not done this yet. It's on my to-do list. In fact, my like very there's a particular project I want to use it for. Um, there's a very soon to-do list for this. But I think what happens is um, when you take it out of the vacuum chamber, you wrap it in foil. And then you put it in, then you bake it. Um, I specifically bought a little toaster oven for the shop for this purpose. So I don't know the details. I don't know the specific step-by-step -step sequence. Don't hold me to it. I'm wrapping it in foil, read the directions. But um, if memory serves me correctly from what I read about it, when I was exploring this, yes, there's a baking step. If you're not familiar with what we're talking about here, Cactus juice is a stabilizer that um, you fill a vacuum chamber with the stuff. You put wood in there or a piece of deer antler in there, whatever it is. And then you apply vacuum to the vacuum chamber. And that draws this product right into the pores of the material. So instead of putting, um, you know, penetrating epoxy is similar in that you can brush it on. And I've used that to stabilize some pretty punky wood that I then turned with cactus juice in a vacuum chamber, it's drawing it through and through, right into the pores all the way through the material. You can dye the cactus juice if you want to. So if you wanna put a green or pink or blue tint to what you're doing, again, that color will go all the way through. So I know just enough to be dangerous. You know, I know it's cool and I know I wanna do it, um, but I've not actually done the process. Fred says he's planning to make a workbench, thinking about using two by fours glued together on edge for the top. My concern is wood movement. My understanding is that wood will move most across the face grain, which in this case will be up and down because the two by fours will be lying on their sides. Will that be a problem? What movement can I expect front to back? That is with the side grain up. Well, I still need to allow for that. So yeah, I think even if you um so what he's talking about is not doing two by fours this way but two by fours this way face to face so movement is yeah it's most prevalent across the width of a plain sawn piece 
which would be what that is in a two by four. When you do this and you're face to face, you're still going to get movement, especially, you know, if the bench is 24 or 30 inches wide, that's a lot of real estate. Um, so you're still going to want to accommodate movements. And then he mentioned Z clips. I'm not feeling the love on Z clips for something like a workbench. I think you want a more robust fastener than that. Um, so you can make shot made clips that are similar to Z clips. That would be helpful. Something like a figure eight fastener, I think would be a little bit more robust for this than a, um, than a Z clip. Another way to do it that I've used on projects. Hang on. And this might be my favorite method for what you're talking about. I'm looking for a round of it. Yeah. Yeah. Coming back. And of course, I'm not finding. Oh, there it is. Okay. So. This particular router bit is designed to be used for screws. And it's a CMT product. So this part of the router bit, you do a plunge cut. This part of the, part of the router bit makes a small slot. The shank of the screw can go through. This part cuts into the wood and creates like a counter bore. Get where the camera can see that and focus. Um, that creates a counter bore for the head of the screw. So if you did this, if you made this cut in rails that are going this way in your workbench um, across the short direction, you cut this groove, you cut another groove, you cut another groove, and then you put screws through those grooves. Um, and you could use a pretty heavy duty screw, you know, an aggressive threaded screw. That would be a really good way to fasten a solid wood workbench top to a base and still allow movement. Um, I would read you the number from the shank of the bit, but I've used this so many times. Oh, maybe I can make it out. CMT, try 813601. That is not my phone number. That is the part number of the router bit. 813601. If um, Google fails you on that, it's a screw slotting router bit. But like I said, it, it allows you in one pass to cut for the shank of the screw and the head of the screw. Basically, you're making an elongated groove that will allow the top to move independently of it. That would be a really good way to do a workbench. Maria says, hi, Ron. I don't know if she's addressing another question. Anyway, I don't know. Um, hi, Ron. Being female and short, I keep running into the same problem of the height of a tool isn't a comfortable height, which needs, means I need to make my own stands. What height is the right height and what tools do I need to make sure are at the right height? Um, well, you want you want everything to be at a comfortable and safe height for you to work on. So generally for a workbench, what one does is if you put your hand like this with the heel of your hand down. So if you do this, that's the height of a workbench for you. So that's where that height came from. Um, if your average height, you know, for people 5'10 to 6 feet or so, that's going to be around 34 inches, which is why table saws, right? They're out of frame. The table saws are about that height. For a lathe, if you do this, you're looking at your elbow. You want um, the spindle of the lathe to be about at the point right there of your elbow. And then for other stuff, you know, I don't know what else you would make a make a your independent stand for. Um, something like a disc sander. <clears throat> Again, you just want it a comfortable height where, <clears throat> sorry, like I said, I'm particularly raspy today. I don't really know why. 
something like a disc sander where you can be, you want to be able to be above the work and at a comfortable hand height for doing that. So um, it is, I've got some um, bench top tools in here that are on their own stands. Um, and again, you, you know, using those parameters, especially workbench, lathe, um, anything with a work table in front of you, um, that should help you a little bit. Julie says, can you ebonize wood before I glue up or will it interfere with the glue adhesion? So um, as far as I know, if it is completely dry, if you ebonize it and that chemical reaction is completely done, you've changed the look of it, you know, and you've changed the chemistry of it, but glue will still adhere to it. It's not the same as, um, so what ebonizing does is it turns something pitch black. Um, it's not the same as like putting black paint on there and sealing the pores because the pores are still open. So the glue will still grow. Uh, Richard says, I'd like to cut a two inch deep mortise with a router. Longest bit will fit in my router as a one and a half inch cutting length. Can I go deeper than one and a half or is the depth limit the length of the cutting edge? No, you can, you know, if you're going steps, you can cut beyond the cut length of the router bit as long as you safely have enough shank in the collet of the router. So where I'm going with that is don't, um, the general rule of thumb is to have um, two thirds of the shank in the collet in order to be safe. So don't, in order to reach deeply enough on the mortise, don't reduce that safety factor. Um, there are longer bits out there um, that would let you do this with more cut length. But um, no, you can get away with that as long, like I said, as long as you've got enough of the shank still safely in the collar, you'll be okay. Timothy says, some time ago, you demonstrated a method for making wood filler using sawdust from the piece you're working on along with CA glue. Can you review how to do that? So yeah, if you, um, in the world of CA glues, I would most likely do this with a, so let me see if I can show you here. So this is thin. The light is really washing it out. It's like, it's a consistency of water as opposed to medium. So, um, you want fine sawdust, so fine sawdust would be like not the stuff that's coming off a planer or even a table saw, more like what's coming off of a sander. So it's like flour, it's that fine. And then there are a couple ways you can do it. If you work fast, you can mix the CA glue and the sawdust here and then use a popsicle stick or a putty knife to force it into whatever it is you're trying to fill. Or you can put CA glue in the negative in the recess that you're filling and then quickly pack sawdust in over the top of that and then maybe a couple more drops of ca over that sawdust to seal everything in that's really probably my preferred method um it's just the ca glue grabs so fast if i'm mixing sawdust away from the pocket um that tends to start curing out before i can get it applied often so um Little CA glue in the hole, sawdust on top of that, more CA on top of that, and then sand it flush. Michael says, how can I cut a circular dado in a round wooden disc to insert a glass globe? Um, I would, so one way you could do that would be Let's say the round disc, the final product is 12 inches in diameter and the globe is 10 inches in diameter. So if you then made a disc that was about nine and a half inches in diameter and you double face taped that to the disc, you could then use that disc. Can I say the word disc one more time? You could use the template 
as a template, as a guide with a plunge router and a guide bushing to cut your round groove. So guide bushing. If you have this in the base of your plunge router, and let's say you're trying to make a quarter inch groove for that globe. So a quarter inch router bit is sticking out of the center of that. This then is going to ride around that round wooden circle while the um, router bit is making the cut. So you're going to have to do some math, and I would definitely test cut this and scrap, because you've got to accommodate the diameter of the guide bushing as it relates to the diameter of the globe in order to get all of this math to work. Um, I would definitely, you know, I would make the template circle and then I would try that on scrap and make sure the globe is going to fit before I do it on the final product. But that be that would be a relatively easy way to do that um, and get that to work and be perfectly round. Um, sorry, I lost my place. When using wood veneer edge tape with pre-applied adhesive backing to cover plywood edges, what are the chances of the veneer peeling off on its own or being easily damaged? So I've used iron-on banding a lot. And one of the, I think it gets kind of a bad name. And part of the reason it gets a bad name is from incorrect use. So, um, you, you, I use just a household iron to put it on. And part of the thing I think that's really, really important is that when that tape is still hot, I'm using a scrap of wood, hardwood, and I'm pressing over the top of it. So the glue is still not quite set. Um, and you gotta work fast because the glue, as soon as it cools, it's set. So while the glue is still hot, take a hardwood block and press hard to seat that um, companies like Fast Cap make rollers just for this purpose, hard metal rollers. Um, then when you trim the edges to the shelf or whatever it is you're doing, you need to ease those corners. And, in, 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 we use this in the cabinet making class here, um, ease those corners with hand sanding. And what you're getting away from is the opportunity for anything to catch on the edge of that veneer and then pull the veneer with it. So you're doing, you're introducing just a little bit of a round over to mitigate the opportunity for stuff to catch. So when I've done this, I, I don't know, I've got stuff that's pretty old, um, like more than 10 years old and still has edge tape on it that I did back in the day. So I think it's an effective way to cover plywood edges. What is the story, Brian says, about Titebond? Is it better than Gorilla Wood or Elmer's Wood? And if so, why? Uh, what I like about Titebond is they've got a product for everything. So um, I don't know if anybody, you know, it'd be interesting for you to Google like a tool test of glues. Um, Wood Magazine does a lot of tool tests. I don't know that they have or have not ever um, done a glue tool test. Uh, but for me, it's just um, between original and then type on two, type on three, hide glue. There's, there, like I said, there's a product for every application. So it's one-stop shopping that works for me. Carrie says, love your videos and live presentations. Thank you. What would be a good dust collector for a basement or one car garage workshop? on a limited budget. Yes, is my answer. So sorry, but there's dust collectors are one of those things, you know, it's a little bit like answering a finishing question. Um, one, um, I don't know the dust collection category all that well. Two, there's like a billion different parameters. So you need to know what tools you're going to hook the dust collector to. You need to know, um, will more than one person be working at one time? Are you going to, in other words, are you going to isolate one dust collector, one tool, 
or does it need to be able to pick up from multiple tools at once? Are you going to hard pipe it in to your garage, right? Um, garage or basement, or are you counting on using flex hose? Air doesn't move as effectively through flex hose as it does through hard pipe. So um, you need to nail all those things down. And then there are charts where, like for instance, you can find out a table saw should have about 400 CFM cubic feet per minute of airflow in order to have adequate dust pickup. There's a number for a jointer, a number for a planer, a number for a router table. And then you can find on a dust collector what its CFM rating is, keeping in mind that that's a raw number like when nothing is connected, connected when there's no pipe on the dust collector, right there at its nose, it's moving 1200 CFM. But once you start to have flex pipe or hard pipe, at the end of that pipe, the number drops up. How much pipe and whether it's um, spiral pipe or flex pipe affects what the drop off is. So um, I can't say here's what you need because you need to do all that research and then that'll tell you what size dust collector you should have. Once you know that, I'm gonna reference Wood Magazine again, then it would be good to find a tool test that says in the category of 1000 CFM dust collectors, here are six good ones. Uh, Fred says, when gluing up a cutting board, I want to clamp calls across the board to keep it flush. Will I have clamps going in two directions? Which should I tighten up first, the calls and then the glue joints? Um, that's a great question. And we actually cover that in this video series. So I'm going to talk about cutting boards again in that video series in a second here. Um, but when you're doing a cutting board and calls, you have to sneak up in every direction at one time. So if you over tighten this way, and an end grain cutting board is a great example. Um, in the video, what I kept showing you is calls going this way to keep these edges aligned, but you also have to clamp in this direction to keep the, to get this to close. So you have to clamp a little bit this way, and then a little bit this way, and a little bit this way, and then a little bit this way. So you have to sneak up on that clamping pressure in both directions at the same time. Otherwise, the other clamps, like the opposing clamps, can't do what they're supposed to do because you've got so much tension in the opposite direction. Um, so let me hit on this again. Um, on November 15th, next week, at 4 o'clock Central Time, we're doing a special cutting board presentation. So it's the WWGOA Cutting Board Challenge 2023. And with me will be Paul Mayer, Alicia Albertson, Char Miller King. They've all made cutting boards. I've made a cutting board. So we're gonna show you these cool designs we've made. Additionally, we're rolling out at that time the Ultimate Cutting Board Hub. On that hub, we have covered, in general, how to make a cutting board, then how to make an end grain cutting board, how to make a router-based leveling jig to level the end grain cutting board, because those shouldn't go through a planer. Or if the cutting board you're making exceeds the side of your planer, the size of your planer, that handheld router jig is going to help you get that flat. We've also got a jig for putting in juice grooves like this. See that? We've also got a video about putting these detents, finger holds, in the ends of the cutting board to make them easier to pick up. So um, again, the live stream, watch your email for that. That's going to be November 15th. And then again, at that time, we're going to open up that hub plenty of time before Christmas to watch this stuff and start making cutting boards as Christmas gifts. One of the things I want to show you while we're on this topic is um, in the end grain cutting board category, there's this, which is pretty, you know, pretty standard end grain cutting board. Then there's this. 
That's also an end grain cutting board. In fact, that's elm that I milled on my sawmill a bunch of years ago, but that's just a different approach to making an end grain cutting board. That is crazy cool. Um, when this is completely sanded and that gets a coat of finish on it, that book match pattern. So that's mirrored. That's mirrored. That's two different pieces mirrored, two different pieces, two different pieces, two different pieces. Um, that's amazing. So again, that's covered in the video series. So um, November 15th, watch for info. Or leading up to November 15th, watch for info about that live stream. All right, Scott says, I've done planters. Hey, Max, I think. So check the date. So Max has just got a comment that it's November 16th, a live stream. I think it's the 15th, but um, double check me there. Scott says, I've done planters with thermally modified ash that have lasted five years without rot. Yeah, I think the, the thermally modified is pretty amazing stuff. And I think they say 25 years. They can live outside 25 years. Carl says, um, when using an orbital sander, how do you determine when you have sanded enough to move to the next grid? So great question. And this is like anytime you're sanding um, or just cleaning up, every, every cleanup operation is designed to remove the marks from the previous operation. So maybe you plane your material and it's got little ripple marks in it from the plane. So then you start with 80 grit sandpaper and the 80 grits job is to remove the mill marks from the player. Now you've got the mill marks gone. So you move to hundred grit. The hundred grits job is to remove, you know, swirl marks left by the 80 and, you know, kind of microscopic, but they're there. And then 120 takes out the 100 marks. 150 takes out the 120 marks until you get to the point where you're gonna quit. So um, this is where having a really low light across the table where you're working is a huge benefit. Cause you want it like when you're sanding this, you wanna have a good light source there so you can get down here and look across that and see if there are any marks left. And you're done when you're done, you're done with each grit when you have removed the previous grits marks that were left behind. And same on a lake, you know, when you're sanding on a lake, that's not an orbital sander, but um, you're taking out, the first grit you use is taking out tool marks, and then the next grit is taking out that grit's marks all the way through. Alan says, I saw your info, I saw your info concerning pentacryl to stabilize green wood. Can you use the chemical to the end of a green log? Can you use the chemical to the end of a green log? Well, you can, um, I've used it to paint log rounds. I mean, I've used it to saturate log rounds. I don't know if you mean, like you wouldn't use pentacryl to seal an end grain the way you would use anchor seal. Um, that's not what it's for. It's it's for stabilizing the cells of the wood to prevent the wood from uh, um, it's not a sealer for end grain left over latex paint. What is a good, preferably free software to design projects? SketchUp. Um, there's still a version of SketchUp that's free and lots, you know, one of the benefits to it is it's pretty endemic. And as a result, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of videos out there about using SketchUp that'll help shorten the learning curve. Kevin's got a turning question, which is, I watched a video where a turner turned a bowl using wet wood to rough shade, nukes it in a microwave several times to help dry it, then turns it to final shape, have you done this or have an opinion on it? I have, and one lesson out of this is don't use the microwave you then plan on, you know, heating up soup in. Um, 
I think that the wood I experimented on this with was, weird sentence, um, cottonwood, and it had a horrible smell, which was forever in the plastic interior of that microwave. So that then became my shop microwave I only use for doing stuff like that. So I've done it um, a little bit. There's a video um, you could try. I think it's on GOA. I don't remember if we did it for a DVD or I did it as a video clip. Um, it's definitely an art more so than a science. Um, depends on the wattage of your microwave. You got to, you know, your power level that you're going to use, the time it's going to be in there. If you over zap it, you're going to crack the bowl. It's just like any occasion where um, if you try to dry any wood too fast, that's bad for it. So you've got to do it at just the right rate. What is that rate? Yes. Um, you got to just experiment with it. On a, on a very interesting scale, there's a Turner in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. I believe his last name is Lee, L-E-I-G-H. You can Google him. And he turns these vessels that are huge. Like he's putting stuff on a lathe that is so big He's using a chain hoist and a boom to get it over the lathe and between centers. He turns it green and then he built basically a walk-in microwave. And I, I'm talking about stuff I knew was true 10 years ago. So I don't know for sure if he's still doing this today, but at that time he built a walk-in microwave and he would put these big turnings into this thing, lock the door, and then start up the microwave and zap them until they were dry. Um, so it's uh, it would be interesting to Google him just to see if he's still doing that and kind of get his backstory. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's something I've done like this much of. I've experimented with it. Um, it's not something I routinely do. Uh, um. Fred says, I'm a 65-year-old woodworker who began woodworking last year. Good for you for starting something new. Um, you've been wonderfully helpful. Well, thanks. I'm glad I can help. Um, sorry, I just got, sometimes I get lost in the scrolling on the chat board here. So there's a YouTube comment saying, lead painted lumber through a thickness, thickness planer, question mark. I have acquired a lot of reclaimed lumber with lead paint under latex. Is it safe to run through a thickness planer? I wouldn't. Um, I just think you're taking so much risk with exposure there. Um, I wouldn't touch that. Um, so yeah, so Max confirmed the cutting board extravaganza again is going to be November 15th, four o'clock central. Can it be too cold to run a table saw or any other power tools? I work in a garage that's not insulated or heated. So I, I don't know, I mean, I, I was in that same boat for the early years of my woodworking. Um, and a lot of you know, I did a lot of my early woodworking on a shopsmith. That's a belt driven machine. Um, so my biggest thing was when it was really cold, that belt would just kind of be colded into the position it was at rest at. So I would often just kind of turn everything over by hand before I turn the machine on. But I don't, you know, with induction motors, with the bearings that are in the trunnion on your table saw or your jointer or your planer, um, I think they're all okay to run cold. Um, I would maybe, you know, like your car, give everything a to give everything a chance, turn on, let it run a little bit before you're going to put it under load, and then go from there. But I don't think the cold inherently is bad for the tools. Oh, did we did the did the video quality go weird? Um, on my monitor here which is a direct feed for my camera, it's fine. On my laptop over here, um, it looks like it's okay, but it's hard for me to tell. 
Jim says, have you ever used food coloring to dye wood products? I have not, and I'm not sure you could. Um, aniline dye is the bomb, and you can get that in every color of the rainbow and more, and that would... Um, if, if where you're going with this is you're trying to dye them and keep them food safe, I don't know that aniline dye would be. Um, my guess is I don't I don't know that you could get I don't know that you could get food dye um, like you'd use in a cake batter to to color the wood. You'd have to experiment with that. Not something I have done. Uh, Fred says, is CA glue as strong as yellow glue, like tight bond, and will it hold as long? They're just, you know, they're similar but different. Like, you, you don't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do an edge-to-edge -edge glue up on a cutting board with CA glue. Um, the PSI strength of CA is very high. Um, one of the really interesting things when tight bond Bob was here, and I think he said this on the live stream. If not, he said it on another video. He has got um, stuff glued together with CA glue that has been underwater in his office for like 12 years or some incredible amount of time. And it's still bonded together. So um, they've got, you know, they've, they've got their um, niches that they satisfy and they both got their strength things, but one uses them for different applications. Um, Kip says, how bright a light is needed to look at sanding marks you mentioned and also when applying sealer, there are so many choices. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, a nice LED light that is, um, I don't know, let's experiment with this a little if we can. So, hang on. This is a video light I use, and its its intensity is a eustable. So see, I'm dimming it. So right there, it's at a hundred percent, but I don't know. There's no indicator on this of how many watts that is. What I was hoping was, if I would like that hundred percent is uber bright. Well, that's actually pretty good. Um, but there's nothing telling me how many watts this is outputting. So just, I'm going to say comparatively, based on how bright this is when it's on full, that's got to be 150 watts, maybe. I don't know, I'm really spitballing it there. But that gives you a starting point. You know, like these LED work lights, I mean, that's a studio light, but um, LED lights in general have become so inexpensive um, that um, it's, it would, it, if you get one and it's not quite right, it's not that horrible to get, a, to get another one. Uh, William says, can you show the boards again? The cutting boards? Yeah. So, um, William gave me a wonderful segue, and I'm going to mention this again. So we now know we have the date right, November 15th, 4 o'clock Central Time. I'm going to get joined, I'm going to be joined by Paul Mayer, Shar Miller King, Alicia Albertson. We've all made unique cutting board designs, and we're going to show you those designs. Then we've got the plans for how to make those. So for instance, this is my submission. So we've got the plans for how everybody made their board. That'll be available for you as a PDF. Additionally, we, WWGOA, has created an entire cutting board hub that will be available where there's a video just about, in general, how to make cutting boards. And that includes prepping the material, um, what materials do you need to wipe down because they're oily before you do a glue up, what's the best glue to use, how to prep for finishing, what's good finish to use. In addition to that, so that's an edge grain board. Then there's another video 
that shows you how to put together end grain boards like this and like this. That's also an end grain board. There's another video that shows you how to put in the juice groove like this one has. Another video shows you how to put these detents in the end grain. So there's a spot for your fingers. And then there's a fifth video that takes you through building a handheld router slab leveling jig so that when you do something like an end grain board, which can't go through your planer because it can chip out, uh, you can use that end grain, I'm sorry, that handheld router shot made jig with a router bit to level these boards. So um, all that hub is going to get opened up and that'll be available to you on the 15th, along with these PDF downloads that um, take you through the how-to of the boards we made and just all the stuff I just got done talking about. There. All right, let me wash the scratchy voice down again. Jim is making Christmas tree candy trays. That's cool. Um, and how many? So you're very early. It's not even Thanksgiving yet. Good for you. I'm in the middle of, uh, oh, it's out of my, it's with my blacksmithing stuff. So I'm making someone, I don't want to say who, a knife from a something. If I tell you what I made it from, they'll know who it's for. So I can't say that, um, but it's something I forged in my forge and anvil over there. Um, that's coming. It's pretty far along. It's almost another another day, and it'll be ready for the handle, which I'm excited about. Um, Fred says, "Would MDF or MDO make a good workbench top? If so, two layers, or would plywood be better? If so, any particular kind." Um, MDO would be overkill. MDO is not inexpensive, and you don't need it to be exterior. It would be, it, it wouldn't be a bad bench top because it's, I mean, it's a very flat plywood, and I think it does not have voids in it. Um, but MDF is inexpensive. It's very hard. Um, my finishing table, which is over there, it shows up in some of the videos. That has an MDF top on it. And then I sealed the heck out of the MDF with um, linseed oil. So, cause that's also my glue up table. So if glue drips, it doesn't stick to the MDF. So um, I like MDF as a workbench top. It's stupidly heavy. So it adds a lot of mass to your workbench automatically. Um, I, and, it's, and it's dead flat. So it offers a lot of attributes that are great choices. Um, have you used tight bond veneer glue? How does it compare to others? So yes, I've used it. And if you're not familiar, um, when you're gluing veneer to a substrate, you can do that with conventional yellow glue. Veneer glue has got a little bit more body to it. One of the things you can, can run into with conventional wood glue and veneer is the glue telegraphing through the veneer. So with a veneer glue, um, it's got a little bit more substance to it so that it is less likely to do that. How it compares to others, I don't know because it's only tight bonds that I ever use. Um, I don't know if this video is on the site or not. It's out there on DVD. A bunch of years ago in my old shop, I made a, uh, I made a jewelry chest, a jewelry armoire with bowed fronts on the drawers. And then I veneered over those bowed fronts with ambrosia maple veneer. And that was where I used that tight bond veneer glue. Um, it came out really cool. Um, and I, again, that's the application where I use that veneer glue. And Jim says he has got 14 Christmas tree candy trays done so far. Wow, good for you. You are, you are Santa's elf well in advance of Christmas Day. That's very good. I tend to be hustling a lot the last week or so. Um, the other thing that's worth pointing out is, so um, I've talked a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot about the upcoming bowl, or sorry, cutting board 
like my brain is now in bowl turning because of Christmas. Um, the upcoming cutting board thing that we're going to do for you. But um, if you scroll down just a little bit, you're going to see a banner on your page where it says ultimate guide to wood species. And that also gets, that also gets referenced when we do the cutting board stuff, because you got to pick the right material for your cutting boards. Um, you want it to be close grain. You want it to be um, a hardwood, which means a hard wood. Um, the other thing that gets referenced there is the Jake Jenka hardness scale. So um, grab that wood guide. That is a very, very, very comprehensive PDF put together by Gary Coyne. There is so much information there about hardwoods, how plywood gets graded, um, all sorts of stuff that's going to help you, whether you're doing a cutting board or a cabinet, it's going to be very helpful when you're choosing material for your next project. So grab that ultimate wood guide and um, it's a resource you're going to really lean on. John has finished 25 eight by 12 cutting boards. Wow. For a nephew's wedding at centerpieces. That's cool. Where are they going after the wedding? Like not where are the bride and groom going? Where are the cutting boards going? Uh, who gets to take home? Like, so if, it does, if it's in the middle of a table and eight people are at the table, who gets the cutting board? That's pretty cool. Um, have you ever done basket illusion work? Just tried my first ones. It takes time and math. Nope, that is not something I've done. Is there a trick to installing side mount drawer glides? Just did a project that took me hours and a bunch of trials to get them aligned. There, there are a couple of things I do, and I'm pretty sure this is one we have covered. Um, use the search option on GOA for drawer glides or um, drawer slides, and um, I used them on a cherry dresser that is a video. So I think we broke out the slides as a separate technique. Um, so check that out. Yeah, there are there are tricks. And uh, if things start going kerfluey, they go real kerfluey real fast. Um, Steve says the best way to clean up a live edge, it depends. Um, I am a big fan of mop sanders. So this is, that's a mop sander. So it's kind of like a buffing wheel, but these are all abrasive fingers. When you put that in a drill, handheld drill, and you run it against the material, it'll clean it up without significantly changing the edge. The tool I use more frequently today this this is the tool's name is the restorer and what's cool about this is so that's like that's a little wire wheel that's in there right now if i do this and this and this i can do this so i can take out the wire wheel i can put in a flap sander I can take out the flap sander and put in a drum sander. I can put in like scotch bright type wheels. There are a variety of different heads you could put in there. What I really like about it is it's got dust collection. So when I'm working a live edge, um, you know, I can pick the level of abrasiveness that I want, which if you do the wire wheel like that, you're gonna really take off a lot of stuff or you can use that flap sander to just clean up like I was just talking about there. So um, there it says right there. Restorer is the name of the tool. All right, folks, we have hit five bells. So uh, as always, thanks so much for watching. Thanks to Typhon for keeping us live and um, watch for that upcoming cutting board stuff. Grab a copy right below the chat roll of that ultimate uh, wood guide PDF. A lot of good information there. And we will see you, well, in less than a week, we'll see you with three other guests with me 
on our live stream about the cutting boards. 